Okay, connecting the cloud server. My computer is still fried, so I'm doing this full of substitution anything. Did someone okay. explode a can of Coke over it? Well, if I could get the attention of the class, we're talking about something that's going to be on the exam. Oh, there we go. I got eye contact words. Green eggs and ham. Eggs and ham. Green eggs and ham. Okay, so we're going to talk about the tangent plane stuff, because this is actually really, really important. Um, it's a good practice. Uh, in terms of your engineers, you're going to be approximating surfaces and stuff like that. And so lots of computational models are derived from this theory, and that's important. And also, um, it's easy. So that's kind of good for all of, all of us. So we're actually going to talk about 15.6 in more detail. Um, oh, before we actually did that, there's an illustration I thought of for the gradient in terms of like direction. So raise your hand if you have at any point played or seen Minecraft being played. Oh, wow. Okay, great. So you know how you have the compass? You can build a compass and it tells you where you're at. So what's happening is you are in a three-dimensional game environment, right? There's X's, there's Y's, and there's Z's. But you, as so long as you're not cheating or you don't have an elytra, you're stuck on the ground, basically, right? And so as you turn around, it's changing, basically, your direction in this plane of X, Y. But as, of course, you navigate through a world, you go up mountains, you go down things, you go into caves, et cetera, et cetera. What you're doing is you're changing your Z value. But at any point of time, no matter where you are currently standing, depending on the direction that you choose to face, at least in your XY plane, there is going to be a direction that's going to be increasing your Z value the most. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what the gradient is going to be, as if that compass was pointing you. Suppose there was one that always pointed in the direction of greatest block increase in that particular direction. No sanity. Y is up and down. Z and X is down. Z is up. No, Minecraft. 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 Yeah. Oh, that's disgusting. Okay, well. <laughs> oh, you know, you know why it's like that? It's because scientists probably put that together, and so they're used to doing like this kind of a setup where they put the Z down. That's why calculator really messed me up because Y is supposed to be up. Oh, that's actually good context for me. Okay, so. The pop culture is destroying you guys. Yeah, this is true. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. Change my Alright, guys, let's let's bring it in. Tangent planes and Mendoza and linear approximations. Yes. What's that? This is fifteen point six. So let's recall. I want to teach this to you in the way uh, in a way that goes back as to something that you've already learned. Okay, and I think that you've already learned. <clears throat> raise your hand if this is familiar to you. Linear mm. approximation in calculus. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so linear approximation is where we decide, okay, so I have like, some sort of a question. This is my x, my y. So I have some sort of a function. And specifically, if I choose a point, then x is equal to a. If I choose this point, and I take the tangent line here, I can create a line that is tangent to a function. And so if we want to call this L of x, what is the slope of this particular line? This is a function f of x. The derivative of f of x at a. That's prime yeah, a. that's prime a. Okay, and then x minus the x coordinate plus the function value. And so the, func the function value is just the function evaluated at a. So this is calculus one. That's what we do. We make a line. And then we say, okay, so in this neighborhood, so around the x values of a, right? we can get an approximation of what the function value is going to be by plugging into not the function, but into the line. Because locally in this, in this area here, the line is approximating what the actual curve, uh, what the actual function value is. Now it's not perfect. Um, it's not necessarily perfect, but it's close. And so that's the idea. And so computers handle linear equations much easier and uh, compared to some other things. And so if we can get lines 
and regions around something, a specific point of a function that might be very complicated, you can get numbers that are decimally close enough to what the function is actually equal to without having to perform computations or calculus on the obnoxious term. You can just do it on a line. So the same exact idea just extends itself into three dimensions. So what's going to happen is, is everyone take out your speed of ID real quick. And now if you have some sort of a surface, can I use your cap real quick? Thanks. Here's my ID. And so what we can have is we can have some sort of surface where down here is the xy plane and here's what the surface value is. Now, the difference between this surface and a regular function is that this function is restricted into just two dimensions. But now, the since our input space is x and y, and then it's like a coming up vertically like this, where we're getting function values. And so now, we don't just choose some x equals a as a point, right? We have to choose a input coordinate, x, or some, some, some a comma b, right? Some x and y value. And then there's going to be a point. So I'll designate that point kind of right here with my finger. And so if I wanted to not, I wanted to find a tangent plane, a plane that's tangent exactly to that point, that's kind of like this. See? So if you have some sort of an object and you can use, you can, I, I personally use my ID or a card or some hard surface to get a visualization of what this concept of tangent plane is. Because as I move about this surface, that plane is going to be different things. The plane is rigid in the same way that a line is fixed. It doesn't have any curvature. We think that this has no curvature. That's easier to work with. In the same way, planes, you've got to think of it as functionally the same thing as how a line behaves for us in R2. So this is how this is going to work. Now, the idea is when we think of the hat, if I want to know how tall the hat is, I can use this plane given by where my finger is to approximate around the crown of where that elevation is. Use plugging into a plane. And all of the plane equation stuff is it's just linear idea copied through this over. And that's going to be easier sometimes in some cases than actually having to figure out whatever the equation of Mike's hat's going to be and then trying to figure out and do the calculus on that. So it makes sense on why we do this in the first place. It's just an extension off of why we did a linear approximation um, in Calc 1. Thank you. Thank you. So try to keep that visual intuition going. I can't, I can't draw that. I tried I, in my lecture notes. There's just a massive whoosh where I crossed it out because it was so bad. <laughs> so that's why I was like, oh, we got to switch to a more physical example there. But does that make sense? So when you do tangent planes and linear approximation, basically we're just saying, OK, we're approximating with something that's linear in nature. And that's going to be easier to model surfaces that are not necessarily uh, well behaved or easy to compute with. So, a few things is when we did a linear approximation, the reason why I knew how to generate this is because I know the two ingredients for a line. I needed a slope and I needed a point, which in this case, the point is a next to a, right? But the idea is slope, point, a point slope, and that tells me how to get this line. Now with the tangent plane, what are those two ingredients now? Vector. Exactly. So the point is the same. So we need a point, but now instead of a slope, we need a normal vector because then we can take that dot product. And so long as that dot product is zero, you have all things orthogonal to your normal vector, and that's going to generate your point. Okay. So let's see. Let's start with the, a definition here. And this will be the first thing. Remember when I talked about there's a difference between having explicit forms of surfaces versus implicit mm -hmm. forms of surfaces. We'll start with the implicit form, and then we'll work to the explicit. But I start with the implicit only for the reason that it's going to most resemble the work you've already done in the equations. So if I have some implicitly defined, well, let me write the definition first. That'll be easier. I'll get into the differences later. Definition. Now this is going to be equation of a line or equation of the tangent plane when you were given implicitly. And there'll be another formula that we use for explicit. 
but we're going to let the capital F uh, be differentiable. Differentiable at the point. At the point some p naught, and then let's just do this in three dimensions. So we can have some x naught, y naught, z naught. Notice how I utilize the naught to indicate these are not truly variables, but it's just like a fixed constant representing uh, those uh, different uh, dimensions. And then with, we want a non-zero gradient. So whatever this gradient is, I want a non-zero vector gradient. And as a reminder from the last two days, a gradient is a what? Vector. But a gradient is a vector. vector. We're going to utilize that today a lot. So the plane, plane uh, tangent to the surface, to the surface, f, x, y, z equals zero. Notice that that's the explicit definition. So now these are these aren't subscripted with anything. That's the actual variables of the function. So on the left side here, this is a function equals uh, to zero. And at uh, our point p naught, sometimes I'll reference the point with just p naught to be efficient because it's understood to be these coordinates. So you understand how my notation works. And we call this, so called, the tangent plane. Tangent plane. This is the plane passing through P naught orthogonal. To the gradient and the gradient specifically evaluated at the point. Notice that notation. I could have said f of x not y not z not, but since I've already defined to you that p not means x not y not z not, I'll just go to that and make it faster. Uh, so an equation of this tangent plane. Here's how it works. It's going to be you. You actually technically don't need me to give this to you because you already have it in your notes. You have it from in, I think it was like 13 or 14 point something when we did the equation of a plane. And so the equation of a plane, if you have a normal vector and you have a point, that's all you need because the components of the normal vector is going to be the coefficient that stands out front. And then you just simply do x minus whatever your chosen x coordinate is, the y minus your chosen y coordinate, the z minus your chosen z coordinate. But this is nothing new. That's what I'm trying to emphasize here. And so in the event that we have a gradient, a gradient is a what? Vector. Vector. And so specifically, just, just for us, so we're outside of the definition now, is just remember that the gradient f at this point is a vector where the x component is going to be what? Right. And then since we're evaluating at a point, we would plug in the point after we've done that. And then what about the y coordinate? The partial. Point. And then what about the z coordinate? Partial z. Yep. Partial at the point. That's our vector. So pretend like that's an n is equal to the gradient at the point. So now I think about this in terms of chapter 14. Here's your normal vector. These are just the coefficients of that normal vector. And so you can generate what this formula is going to look like, right? It's going to be the x component of the normal vector, which is fx naught. But just think about it as like your a, your b, your c for normal. And that's going to be multiplied by x minus x naught, which is the x coordinate here. So from this pattern, you can generate the rest. What is the next uh, little piece going to be? Perfect. Someone else, give me the last one. Partially Z 
Yeah, that's perfect. And then what's the very, very last thing we put at the end of this entire chain? Equals zero. Yes. This equals zero. Why does equal zero again? Do you remember the motivation for that? Just Say it again for a good bit, Rebecca. This is a dot product. Dot product. We're taking the dot product of our normal with these vectors of the point to the point that we chose. And so this times this, this times this, plus this times this, all equals zero. And we want the dot product to be zero because a dot product, if it's zero, what does that mean about the two vectors? There you go. And that's why we call it a normal vector. So it's all of the same thing. And so this is how it works implicitly. So let's go through an example uh, of the implicit. The implicit isn't important as the explicit, which we'll get to, but then we get comfortable in reviewing uh, what you've been practicing. I'm going to keep that side up and I'll erase just the last one. I think that the main thing that I want to, to emphasize to you though is for implicit that the normal is the good thing. Like it's kind of the underlying thing of today. So actually I'll put that up here next to my little class part. Okay. The normal is the I didn't, it's an, an arthritis, so I'll give it an article. The normal is the gradient. Everybody say the normal is the gradient. Normal, normal is, is the gradient. gradient. Normal is the gradient. So if you remember that, you pretty much have linearization um, in application. But let's actually do a problem. So here's an example. This is going to be f, x, y, z. And what this means is we're going to stick all of the variables on one side. So it's going to be, let's do x squared over 9 plus y squared over 25 plus z squared minus 1 equals 0. And we're interested in the point p naught 9, 25, 1. So something, if you were given these ingredients or something, and you're saying, hey, find the, tan the, find the tangent plane to this specific surface given implicitly at this specific point. Okay, So let's go down the laundry list. So when we need two ingredients, right? What two things do we need for a tan uh, equation of a plane? Uh, we need a point oh. and a vector. Yeah, and so, so you said vector, someone said normal, so yes, make sure we understand that it's a normal vector. Point and normal. Okay, do we have the point? Yeah. Yeah, so that's actually given to us. That will be provided for you, so good. So what's the one thing we don't have? Normal. Okay. And what did we just say the normal is? Our gradient. gradient. Yes, normal is the gradient. And so potentially we should just find what the gradient is, right? So the gradient of f, I'm not plugging anything in yet. Let's just figure out what the, what the variable form is going to be. So derivative with respect to x is going to be what here? Uh, 2x over 9. Yeah, good. And then because everything else is uh, separated out, so then that makes it easy. What about the y component? 2y over 25. Good. And then the z component? 2z. 2z. Yep, that's all good. So now this is the gradient, and then now to get our normal, we'll actually apply the gradient to the specific point we're interested in. Does that make sense? Yeah. So don't forget to do that. This is going to be the point where um, uh, of confusion sometimes. Just, you'll get here, and then don't think that this is what you're substituting, right? You actually want to plug in your point. Okay. So your gradient evaluated at the specific point 925, 1. Two. So Two ninths times nine is what? Two. Two twenty fifths times twenty five. Two. Is, and two times one is two. Okay. Interpret somebody for me what this vector is. Yep. So this is the gradient at our point. And what does this say? Exactly. 
So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this as our normal for the plus two. You don't have to write this, but if I see this on your exams or labs and stuff, then I'll know you know what's up. And so I would be more willing to give you partial credit in the event you mess up arithmetic, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we've got a normal vector. So we're pretty much there. So how do we put, how do we string everything together? Dot product. Okay. And so the form is going to be the x component of the normal minus then the difference between your x and your x naught. So here is my two from A. And then for x, what am I subtracting from x? Uh, yeah, because that's the x coordinate. And then what's the next thing going to be? Plus two. Y minus five. What's that next thing going to be? Plus two. Z minus one. Equals zero. zero. Don't forget the equals zero. If you really wanted to, you could just divide everything three by two. Uh, but if you left it like this, that's that's right. Okay. So thumbs up if you can do that on your own, or at least follow the logic. Sweet. So on a scale of oh that's terrifying to oh that's not terrifying at all, where are we at? Not there. Not terrifying. Okay. Now let's move over to the explicit portrait of things. So this has been, has this been explicit or implicit, guys? Implicit. Good. Why is it implicit? Because our function equals zero. Yes. Everything over here, all the variables have been put together. Zero is by itself, so it's implicit. Now we're going to go to explicit, where we'll say, now the z value is equal to, ba 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 ba, with respect to our input points x, y. Oh, keto. You know, I would I would really take good notes on what I'm about to put on the whiteboard here in the event that one of your letter grades depends on it in the future. Okay, so no. if we're giving it explicitly now, so the explicit form is going to be z is equal to f of x comma y. So this is still a function with three variables involved, but now we're just giving the third one as dependent to the other two. Whereas with the implicit, z does not need to necessarily depend on x and y, they all work together. So here's our explicit form. Now, we can use what we already uh, know. And so if I wanted to get everything onto one side, right? What if I turn this implicit, right? So I gotta just push this over. So I could take z and I could subtract the x's and the y's, whatever this, you know, vegetable salad is, and then we have equal to zero. Okay, so this is technically implicit because we have something equal zero. And all of the x, y, and z's in some combination with their functions over here, go over here, and then it's zero. Now, because of this, I can essentially say I have implicitly x, y, and then z is f of x, y, but I'll just stick that in here so that it's not confusing the equation. z minus f of x, y equals zero. Thumbs up, but you've got that. It's basically, we, we decided to put the z's and the x's and the y's all on one side. That's all we did. Okay. So you think of it, this, this is almost like a special case of the implicit. And now we find a gradient. So our gradient, gradient f, is going to be the partial derivative. Now, notice we're subtracting it. So it's going to be minus the partial derivative of little f with respect to x, whatever that might be. And then for the y, it's going to be negative again, because this minus is applying to both the x and the y. We'll differentiate with respect to y. But then the easy one, this is what makes it different. What about the third component here, the z component? Just, uh, yeah, it's just one. Because we're taking the derivative with respect to z of the z. 
So we get this very specific gradient, right? And now to get a plane, so we have, this time we kind of did it backwards. Now we have our normal vector, right? This is our normal. What's the other ingredient we're missing? Point. Point. So let's just choose one. So we'll choose some point and we'll call it P naught again. And then X naught, Y naught, Z naught. So it's an arbitrary point there. And now if you think about this, since the, we can do it in terms of our explicit because since this is, Z can be found in terms of this little f, x, y, instead of saying Z naught, we can actually be more specific. That Z naught is going to be whatever the function is evaluated at x naught and y naught. Does that make sense? So this is very parallel to how in Calc 1, we would say, oh, if I have a function f of x and I'm interested at a point, x naught, but then the y value <laughs> being described because y is depending on x. Did you see how those synonymous ideas? This is the same as stuff I had said x naught, y naught. This is relabeling it to indicate the dependency uh, between the variables. Okay. So that's what's going on right now. This is still, think of it as you said not, but I'm indicating specifically to you, hey, we were given it explicitly. And so let's, let's show that, that this is actually a dependent variable on the other two. So it in itself doesn't run on its own. Okay. And then all we gotta do is plug into the formula, right? So what's the, what's the basically A component, the X component of our normal vector? Negative uh, partial. Negative partial. Minus F X. Exactly, evaluated at a point. After we evaluated the point, we have x minus x naught. Okay, what's the next piece going to be? Minus partial y. Evaluated at your point. Times what? Y minus y naught. And then what's the last piece going to be? Minus Plus one. Also notice that, so we've done the minus fx, we've done the minus fy, now we're here at the last component, it's one P times P z minus, and then this, which is the function evaluated at x naught, y naught. And all of this equals what? Zero. Okay. So this is, this is kind of the important step. The rest of here is just going to be algebra. So thumbs up, if you can do from explicit definition and follow all the way down to here. Okay. What can I help clarify? Um, so, uh, that's a gradient Yes, So why is this one basically? Z. Because here, so here is our capital F. So think about this. We've got Z all by itself. And so if we're going to differentiate this expression with respect to just the variable Z, that's going to go to 1. And then since these are only X's and Y's over here, we consider it a constant. So the entire derivative of this stuff with respect to Z is just 0. So that's why we don't really account for that piece in this last component. It's because the partial derivative of z is the 1, and then we subtract the 0. Does that help? OK. Because what we've done is we've converted the explicit form, and then we're trying to get into what we're familiar with, which is where all the variables are on one side of the equation. And once we're in our more familiar territory, now we're just applying our gradient to all the variables being on one side. These are good questions. Anything else? Plus one times z minus f equals zero. Oh, that's a good question. So here, the um, when we when we put this together in the formula, each one of these coefficients that stands outside, and they're representing the components of our normal vector. So here's our normal vector because the normal is the gradient. And so here was our a, here's the y, or the b, and then here's what we think of c, right? And so here, here, that's just a constant. And so one is always going to be one, regardless of what essentially you're going to plug in. So this is not a function 
that varies too many variables, which is why we can just say one. The, why, the reason why we need to include the point being evaluated here is because uh, the partial derivative with respect to x is actually a function of something. So that'll have variables in it that we need to accommodate. But, and I guess I'll be more specific here. So I'll, um, I know I've been using the p not notation, but I'll expand it out so you can see. Um, it's going to be, ooh, I get to do this backwards because. I didn't think ahead. Why? Not. That's not. Now when they say, you know what, forwards and backwards. That's what I mean. All right. Okay, but does that help clarify now? Because then that, that's the point, essentially, you're plugging in what would have been explicit into here. Because this isn't going to depend with that. So you only need to accommodate these guys. And then now the relationship is a little bit. Does that clarify the. I know you two had a question, so I'll. Why do we put f of xy to the b side instead of putting d on the f of xy side? Very good question. Um, because it doesn't seem like it matters. Hmm. I could pull a math major thing. First, <laughs> left as an exercise to the reader. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to algebraically manipulate this, this one more time to just get to what we consider to be the explicit formula. I'm pretty sure it doesn't actually matter. So long as you obey the rules, and you just there might the only thing I can think of is there could be potentially a small nuance in um, this depending on x and y. So then if you if you properly accommodate that though, it should work. Sure. Math won't break. Yeah. Well, unless you do goals and completeness there, but that's not for today. Okay, and then you had a question? Oh, you should just add this to this. Okay, that was it. Yeah. So why specifically? Yeah. The reason one of, another reason why we go this way too is because if we uh, if we pushed, um, I think there has to be, let's see, it'd be fx, fy. So this would be fx, this would be fy, that would be minus one. But um, remember that the normal vector is you can, it's normal if you would have multiplied that 3 by minus 1 anyway. So you can choose. Sure. Yeah. And so that has to do more with what you consider to be the direction of your surface. So if its direction is implying it's normal would be upwards, then you can do that. And then if it's un, kind of like concave down. But uh, yeah, that's a good question. So fundamentally, you're right. It doesn't matter because those two normals are just the, the two vectors that are flip flops. Very good question. Anything else? Cool. So the last thing we're going to do is just make this look less important. And first thing we can do is we're going to shove this over here so that it's not minus out front, right? And then notice that when you distribute the one times this minus this, we don't really need to distribute that because it's just z minus that. So we're going to try to get it back into a more explicit form. We're going to keep, notice that the z is the only positive thing over here. Yeah. And so we're going to push the, this entire chunk. We're going to push this entire chunk. And then we'll also just push over this. And so we're going to generate the formula that you're going to want to memorize. It's going to be z all by itself. And that will be equal to, I've pushed this over now, so it's fx evaluated at x not y not. And then times the x minus the x naught. And then I'm going to throw this over here, right? So I add fy. And I'm evaluating fy at the x naught y naught. And I'm multiplying it by y minus y naught. So I've taken care of that chunk. I've taken care of that chunk. This is what I want hanging out over here. And then I'm just going to take over the fx naught minus. So plus s evaluated at x. Why not? Notice I don't, that's, that's the equation. So there's no equal zero at the end of here because this is pretty cool, huh? I like that. That's a good example. Okay. Okay. And here's, here's, here's going to be the kicker. In the same way that you develop this, the explicit form is where we get the linear approximation from. So all we're going to say, and when you go through the textbook, all it's going to say 
is it's going to say, okay, that was a linear approximation. Let's just, instead of saying Z, let's call this sum L X one equals, and then it'll copy and paste to the entire thing. It's the same exact thing. So I'll just put the same thing. So once you learn this, you've got pretty much everything from the session. So I'm going to make a few observations. I'm going to teach you how to learn mathematics a little bit. First observation, if we're going to practically compute this, what can we make a very efficient um, kind of algorithm or laundry list that we can have? So we're going to need to figure out the partial SX and FY, right? Sure. So step one is we're just going to be given some Z is equal to FXY. We'll be given some explicitly defined surface, right, a function. And uh, We'll also be given a point. So, uh, uh, x not y not, and then the function of whatever that is evaluated at x not y not. So that's the information we get. And the second thing, we'll, we, if we want to plug into this formula, let's figure out what fx is, and then figure out what it is. So find fx so that we can find fx x y. What do you think step three is going to be? On the same line of reasoning as that second question. Yeah, let's do the same thing to fy, right? We need it. We might as well do it. So find fy. And we find fy so that we can then plug in our f not y. Find fy. Okay, so we've got that taken care of. That's been given to us. That's something I'll plug and chug. We've taken care of that computation. That's something I'll plug and chug. Well, that's the last thing I need to consider. End off the line. Find f x not y not. And don't overcomplicate this. This is quite literally as easy as identifying the two constants. Well, te technically, you just have to point that to the point. So if you're given, if you're actually given this point, you're already done. So when I say find, like literally just point your pencil and be like, found it. That's the one instance where that one t-shirt meme is like find x and they just circle x. That's kind of how this works. Like find that, okay, right there, <laughs> and then use it. So then last thing, last, um, plug just your favorite thing to do. Granted, plugging and chugging involves you have to know what to chug into or what plug into so you can chug. Um, but okay, that'd be kind of cool. So it's like if you had to derive this equation from the explicit using the gradient and then doing your algebra to get some z equal to blah. And then after you've generated for yourself the formula, just then applying it the next part, that would be pretty cool. That'd be pretty cool, yeah, I like that idea. Okay. <laughs> and then you also have a process to practice, so that's good. Yeah, this is good. Okay. Let's do a problem, shall we? Let's do it. Um, let's see, where I have it explicitly defined. Yeah, I have it explicitly defined. Okay. Example. If there is a time to dial into the lecture, now would be one of those times. 32 minus 3x squared minus 4y squared. And we're interested in the point 2 comma 1 comma 16. Fine. Which hand if you take note of this class? Okay, so what was step one? 
Okay, boom, it's right there. So that's done. What was step two? Step two was to evaluate the portion. Portion. Okay, so that's done. Step three, step four, step five, step six, step seven, step eight, step nine, step 10, and step 11. Okay, and then what is step 12? Step 12 is to write the function that we want to find. So our f, x, and y. Um, negative 6x. Yeah, minus 6x, not very large. And so we did this so that we could find Fx evaluated at what? 2, 1, 16. Oh, wait, where's the mistake? It's just 2 and 1. Because this is given explicitly. So we don't actually, that's oh, like, yeah. remember, think of this that's as the seven. function at 2, 1. So you just have the 2 and the 1. Okay, so what's that going to be? Negative 12. Yeah, minus 6 times 2 is minus 12. Okay. What was the third thing we're supposed to do? Find partial y and evaluate. Okay, so f y is what? Negative eight y. And we do that so we could find that f y at what do we plug into here? Two one. Negative eight. So that's going to be what? Seven. So minus eight times y value. Okay, so what's the fourth thing we're supposed to do? Yeah, identify that the function value at t1 is 16. That's given to us, so we just identify that. Okay, so what's the fifth thing we're supposed to do? Okay, so what does that look like? So go ahead and spell it out. So then it would be minus eight times y minus y naught, which is one, and then after because that's r of both x naught y naught. Beautiful. Cool. And then honestly, if you left it like this, being wrong makes everyone's life easier, yours included, mine included. Because <laughs> guess how many of you will miss. You'll say 12 times 2 is 24. Like 36. And then Six you'll throw it together and you'll get the wrong answer. I'll look at your final answer. Like, what? <laughs> and then I'll have to go back and find, oh, no, they did it right. They just need to go back to grade school. And, and like that. Um, or like you'll forget a minus a minus. So you'll do like minus 8 times minus 1 and you'll call that negative 8 for some reason. Yeah. So just leave it like this. Okay. Once you get it to here, just no touch. <laughs> no touch. <laughs> no touch. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> so my Denzel, if you're going to be in here, I'm going to ask you, don't be a distraction, please. We're going over again. Thank you. Okay, we're going to do another example. You're going to need to know how to do this one because there is a um, there's a little algebraic trick that I'm not sure you have found out by now, um, but I'll show you. So here's an example. If we have some function given explicitly as fxy is equal to 5 over x squared plus y squared. If your gut reaction is, that's disgusting. It's a fraction. I agree with you. And I'm going to show you how to handle it. Okay? So at a point, minus 1, 2, 1. We're going to get this tangent plane because we're now going to, instead of just finding the plane for the sake of finding the plane, we're actually going to do what we came to do, an approximate. So we want to approximate f of minus 1.05 and 2.1 from the linearization, okay? So we'll approximate what that is through the linearization that we get by performing the whole process. Okay, so the first thing is first, that's step one, make this easier to deal with. So let's do f, x, y, and it's gonna be five times x squared plus y squared just to the minus one power. The more power rules you can convert instead of doing quotient rules, the happier you're going to be, the happier I'm going to be reading what you did, and uh, it's gonna be a good time. It'll be more efficient with your calculus. So thumbs up if you can see why. We're just popping that up, make the entire thing to the power of minus one. Yeah. Do yeah. not try to distribute the minus one power to each individual. 
That's like <laughs> cardinal rule of <laughs> sinning against algebra. Like you don't want to do that, okay? Don't do that. Okay. Raise your hand if you take notes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the second step? Fine. 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 So FX now, when we do this chain rule, it's so much easier to see. All you gotta do is drop down the minus one, you get minus five times the inside here, left alone, reduce the power by one. That's the only thing you can't forget to do, reduce the power by one, and then multiply by a chain rule. In this case, X is the variable, so we're multiplying by two X. So that's just minus 10X over X squared plus five. Wouldn't that be Oh, sorry. Yeah, thanks. So, what's four? Uh, excellent. Oh, so, how do you get the negative, the, uh, negative two? Negative two. Power rule. Okay. Think about it. Minus one drops down, reduce the power by one. Minus oh, one, yeah, minus yeah, one, yeah. it's minus yeah. two. Yeah. <laughs> the reason that I throw it back into fraction form is because the whole reason we found this was so that we could figure out and plug in. What are we plugging into? FX? Negative one, two. Because now it's easier to plug in, and you can see how it's going to interact with everything. Right? So it's minus 10 times x over, and then x squared plus y squared squared. So two fifths, isn't that like two point four? Yeah. We're gonna do the decimal because we're about to we're, the point of this is to get into the approximation. Okay. What was the third step on the R thing to do? Oh, to uh, find partial y. Okay, and... so what is that? Fine. Well we do the power rule again, right? So minus five times x squared plus y squared, reduce the power by 1, then multiply by chain rule. So, so this is going to be negative 10y over x squared plus y squared squared. Notice the symmetry. Okay. Now we did that so that we could find what? We could evaluate at the negative point negative 1, 2. So we did that so we could evaluate it there. Which and we just do the arithmetic here. So minus 10 times y divided by x squared plus y squared, all that squared. Uh, 20, 25, 4, right. So this one's actually going to be negative. So this one would be negative um, 0 0.8. 8. I say. Yes. Find out for the next one. I mean, what are you looking at me for? This is going to be your exam. What's <laughs> the what are you next for? Find, find out for the next one. Right, so, four. We observed that the function value at minus one, two is going to spit out one. Put it all together. Slap it all together. <laughs> So since we're linearizing, I'll just call it LXY instead of Z. Okay, so. Um. Say it louder, friend. Point four. Okay, cool. So we did the first job. We found what the uh, linear approximation is supposed to be, right? Now, for this step, we did this linearization so that we could approximate. Notice that minus 1.05 is really close to minus 1. Uh -huh. Notice that 2.1 is just a little bit away from 2. Yeah. And so we're going to use a linear kind of form in a plane to figure out what this otherwise kind of ugly thing is going to be. So if you're throwing this into a computer, which end of the computer design? Wow, you're alone. <laughs> Don't worry. So I was about to say, I thought you were computer science too. Just trying to convince it. Get, well, computers are getting really good these days. But in general, it's more unnatural to try to do quotients um, than just a line. So if we plug in our approximation, right? So L of minus 1.05.
I'm like, it what? It was given. This is, yeah, no, this is, this is what we're trying to approximate. So we're trying to approximate this. Oh, yes, I, yes. Oh, that's what happens when you look at your laptop. Okay, so equals zero point four. I'm going to plug in X, and X is minus 1.05, right? Yes. So one minus 1.05 is negative 0.05, right? Mm -hmm. And then minus 0 0.8 times Y is 2.1. So 2.1 minus 2 is this, 0 .1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Yeah. So if you, to, if you were to put this into your calculator, you get 0.9. No. Well, let's see. Did I get that wrong? Because it hit one. Yeah, it's plus one on the end. Yeah, yeah. Because this would be this would be negative. Because this would be worth point one, but negative. Okay. So the interpretation is that the function at minus 1.05 and 2.1 is approximately what the linearization gives us. And with that linearization is approximately, well, so notice that the linearization is the approximation here, but the 0 0.9 is not an approximation of the linearization. So the linearization gives us exactly that's the thing that's approximating. Which, let's verify that. What do we know that the surface is actually supposed to be at this point? Well, right here. Right? Yeah. So that's what it's supposed to be. And so our approximation gets us with point one. That's not bad, uh, considering how rudimentary this is. So if you would have just increased the number of decimal points next to it, you get really, really high accuracy really, really fast. And so this idea of nudging Touching over these little bits is going to motivate our concept of this differential idea. So I'll just throw in a DEF here. This isn't super important, but it's good to be aware of occasionally. So if you have some explicitly given function, then we say that our differential differential dz is like this. So some nudge, some change in your surface height is approximately the infinitely precise, the instantaneous kind of change that Z is going to be the partial and X denominated at the point times the X. And then we just take a comment with the Y component as well. So the function is Y at the point D. Questions? Comments? Concerns? Well, is this a distant um, visual, right? The, the recording? Yes, it's, I'll, I'll be uploading that today. Um, well, also, okay. I'm just going to get this out of the way. I've had a YouTube playlist that I have referenced, I think, 18 times in the last six weeks. That's kind of embarrassing. Guys, just check the deep web, please. Um, I put it under the news item, and then I, after adding it to the news item, I like put it in there again, and then the, I have sent that D two L news item four more times in emails. So next time I get an email asking where the recordings are, I'm going to screenshot D two L and email that to you because you <laughs> can't find it. <laughs> And considering I'm not on a machine that actually is my machine, I don't. It's hard for me to get around it. It takes me like five minutes to try to sort out where I put all the things. In. So I'll just be cool. There, I promise. You. So I've been uploading every single thing same day. So it should everything should be there. Yes, yeah, so if you're gonna review something, this would be the thing. Um, raise your hand if you're still doing textbook reading. The Lone Ranger. Nice. Um, keep up with the textbook readings, especially as we get into, we're transitioning to more detailed applications. And chapter 16 is going to blow your mind with volume. That is a pun and also seriously, though, because 
I cannot keep up in lecture with the number of things and boxes that are going to be happening in the coming chapter, which means that uh, you're just going to have to read it. <laughs> I'll try to cover as much as I can and be as efficient as it's possible, but um, I am merely a human being. And so there's time is very, very limited. One hour is not enough to cover, you know, the entire response of the section. So just it's a heads up that you'll be doing lots of reading in chapter 16. That's why fall break is positioned, kind of like when you get kicked into chapter 16. So you can have that week. That's what I did when I took the class. I used lots of fall break to just make sure that I was reading through all the integration stuff. Because there will be that random application or a random trick. And it's not even you're reading the book just for the, the information. Sometimes examples will outline strategies and patterns that you won't really get to see otherwise, not even them Pearson. And you're like, why didn't they just show me that simplification earlier? Well, it was there, you just didn't read it. So read through for the tricks, read through for algebra. There's a lots of little nuggets like that that's gonna make the next this, this coming exam easier to take. But if you don't do it, then uh, that's between you and your brain. So any questions before we close? Well, Godspeed, if you need help, Email me, come to office hours, and you can do it.